Hi my friends, it's Sergey, and it's a kickoff video for Relationship and Anxiety Summit. So there's lots of amazing interviews and videos that await you for the next seven days and further. And with this video, I want to start with the foundation, with the grounding us in the most important thing, the right mindset, the right mindset for creating an intimate relationship you want to have in your life because that's my mission ultimately to help as many people as I can to create the intimate relationship they want to have and it starts with a deep understanding that happy relationships require work let's talk about it the quality of your life is determined by the quality of relationships in your life so by creating a great relationship you're creating a great life how, but how do we create a great relationship, right? So as psychologist Joanne Davila says, no amount of uh, premarital education can make up for a bad partner choice. A quote that I strongly agree with. But some people take that quote and go further and believe that you only need to work on relationship if you pick the wrong partner but if you found the one and we'll talk about the idea of the one finding the one if you found the one it will be all sunshine rainbows happiness understanding perfect communication and bliss from there so let's talk about it more is it possible that two people two people meet and they naturally get the healthy, harmonious chemistry right from the start of their relationship. Does that really ever happen? Well, yes, it is pos possible to an extent. Tony Robbins says, what makes relationship work is things in common. What makes relationships passionate is things that are different. I love that quote. I'll repeat, what makes relationship work is things in common what makes relationship passionate is the things that are different between partners so let's talk about that like even further so what can be common between two partners what can be similar between partners to get a healthy chemistry number one values values need to be similar or the same if the most important values are vastly different, are opposite, and they don't change, there's no way of being happy together long term. There's just no way. I don't see that happening. Uh, values are important. What else can be in common? It can be a level of intellectual and emotional development between two partners, similar perception, views on specific things, that can be similar as well. What can be different between partners? As I said, values. Values cannot be too different because that, uh, that's what leads, like different opposite values, that's what often causes so-called irreconcilable differences at some point. So the energies of two partners can be different for sure. One partner has a masculine energy and another has a feminine energy regardless of their gender and if that's the case the opposite energies masculine feminine between two partners there are going to be sparks and attraction between them what else can be different between two partners it can be different psychological weaknesses or we can call it weak spots or blind spots or problems or unhealthy parts that can be different between two partners as well as psychological strengths or healthy parts each of us has multifaceted polyhedral identity and a unique psychology with lots of different features with its strong spots and weak spots so where do these come from uh, from our childhood, obviously, from our parents, from our upbringing of uh, environment, 
most of it we simply learn and copy from what we see in our parents, obviously. What happens in relationships is that one part of your psychology, let's say, is weak or unhealthy, but the same part of your partner's psychology, just hypothetically, is strong and healthy and vice versa. And your psychological, when you meet and get together, your strengths uh, meet your psychological, a partner's psychological weaknesses and so on and so, so forth. So their healthy part helps to heal your unhealthy part and vice versa. So you both play a psychotherapeutic role or even a coaching role for each other often unknowingly, unconsciously, without even realizing that. For example, that's how it happens. For example, you struggle with self-love. You don't really love yourself. You don't feel worthy of being loved. And because of that, whenever, let's say, something good happens in your life, you might experience a feeling of guilt or shame because you don't feel that you deserve it. And let's say your partner on the other side have a wonderful healthy feeling of self-love love for themselves and so your partner doesn't have any problems with the feeling of guilt and so what can happen that your partner can show you by their example hey that this is not a practical to feel that feeling of guilt and you see how they love and take care of themselves and you might start just learning that from your partner. You can start changing your behavior, your reactions, uh, just copying it from your partner. And so you see how this happened. Uh, and or you, let's say you are a calm, shy person, unemotional, uh, maybe. And your partner is the opposite, passionate, bouncing off the walls kind of person. So you can balance each other out. They can teach you how to connect with your passion and experience vibrancy, emotional juice. And on the other side, you can teach your partner the benefits of being in solitude and how to connect with their inner world and experience peace. You see how that happens? This self-healing between two partners? Or let's say they lack discipline structure organization willpower and you are on the opposite side like you are very disciplined naturally uh, and it works the same way or let's say your partner has some sexual problems or like psychological fear of intimacy problems and you don't so you can help your partner to get rid of that psychological problem how well you know how just like in marvin gaye's song sexual healing listen to that song that's how so what happens is all of it adds up and it creates a harmony between the two of you and it creates a relationship where not only you heal each other but you contribute to each other's growth psychological and emotional development you see so that's important to understand. And what happens in this kind of relationship often, it looks like what happened in uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, The Beginning of the Armadillos. Uh, so I love that story. Stickly Prickly Hedgehog, who had a friend, a slow solid tortoise, a tortoise. And so there was a painted Jaguar who was hunting them and wanted to eat them and Jaguar's uh, Jaguar's mother told him my son when you find a hedgehog you must drop him in the water and then he will uncoil and when you catch a tortoise uh, you must scoop him out of his shell with your paw and so that's what she told the little jaguar and the jaguar remembered that can't curl but can swim slow solid that's him curls up but can't swim stickly prickly that's him so the hedgehog and tortoise um, decided to unite and help each other 
hedgehog taught the tortoise how to curl up and the tortoise taught the hedgehog how to swim. So they both went through incredible transformation. Hedgehog's spines uh, were all smoothed out. They became smoother, harder uh, and firmer and it all turned into a single shell due to constant uh, contact with water since he learned how to swim. And while the single shell of tortoise has divided into like multiple sections and opened up and he made his shell very flexible. So now they were very similar to each other and had very similar features. So when little Jaguar came to his mother, he said, but it isn't a hedgehog and it isn't a tortoise. It's a little bit of both. And I don't know its proper name. And the mother said, nonsense, everything has its proper name. <laughs> and uh, like, I, I should call it Armadillo. So that's how Armadillo uh, became the name. So till I found out the real one, I would call it Armadillo and I should leave it alone. So that story, I think, is a great example of what often happens in romantic relationships between two partners between a hedgehog and tortoise, right? When people meet, they're often very different, but the more they live together and learn from each other, the more they copy each other's behavioral uh, patterns, they become very similar, very close, like the best friends. And if what they copy is effective, healthy patterns, they have the, uh, their own wounds become like healed better, psychologically stronger, they grow. And when this type of connection, chemistry or, or compatibility happens, that is great. But what's important to understand that that compati compatibility can never be 100%. Like we're 100% compatible. It sounds good uh, in theory, but I'd say it never the case. The best case scenario, probably if we can measure it, probably like 60-70% compatible, so to speak, uh, that's like a great result. If we have that type of compatibility, that's a great, great place to start a relationship. But there's also always this 30-40%, there's going to be the same wounds, same weaknesses, same unhealthy patterns that both of you have. And so that type of natural healing, mutual psychotherapeutic effect just by healing each other, this will not be happening. Not only that, uh, whenever your wounds or weaknesses will collide, it will all often become a source of all sorts of troubles, miscommunications, misunderstandings, fights, disagreements and conflicts. And that is why if you want to create a happy relationship, it is not enough to simply find the one. I told you that we will talk about the idea of finding the one, the right person. The whole idea of finding the one is a problematic one for relationships. Like Esther Perel says, there is no one person that can give us everything we need. No one person can satisfy all our wants and needs completely, no matter how phenomenal they are. Uh, so this type of mindset of finding the one is a setup for frustration, disappointments and disillusionment. Instead, uh, the, what I see much better approach is you find a person and you decide, you find a person who you want to write your life story with. And it's never going to be a perfect story. Just no one can ever have perfect childhood with perfect parents who do their parenting perfectly. You just find a person that you want to write your story with. And it's not about perfection. There is no such thing as perfect anything. Uh, so you will still need to work on your relationship to 
preserve those 60-70% if you have it of healthy chemistry that you have from the start and to turn those 30-40% of mutual unhealthy patterns into healthy ones for both of you through work. Now many people have a negative association with the word work. That's why we don't want to work on our relationship often because work is not fun and we want we want fun so let me explain when i say work on your relationship i don't mean a dismal boring labor that you can't wait to be over but you had to do you have to do no and nor do i mean that you need to become psychiatrists for each other like a relationship coaches for each other trying to point out each other's weak spots you know you messed up here here's my experience with you and so on so it's not about showing each other like the weak spots and behavioral wounds no the word work here comes with an idea of making relationship work the idea is treating your partner with love and care understanding their wants and needs and doing your part on fulfilling them. If you buy a flower, you probably realize that you will need to water it regularly, wipe the leaves. If you buy a little puppy, a dog, you understand that you will need to take care of the puppy, feed to feed and groom and wash him, to take him for a walk multiple times a day. If he gets sick, you will be taking him to a vet clinic. So, you know, you cannot just leave him alone, leave him at home alone and just fly away for vacation for a month uh, just because you know that this little puppy is going to die without you. You're responsible for your little puppy. So that's just how life is. If you want to have something, you get to work on it. You get to create it through your work. If you want to excel in your career, you get to work on your personal professional development, whatever it might require, like reading books, attending seminars, learning new things, new skills, whatever it takes, like networking, working with a mentor, mentor, improving your performance, etc. So what does it mean to work on your relationship specifically? So the biggest part of that work is literally to work on the communication between you and your partner. Work on your communication between you and your partner. And we will talk more about that in our next videos. Thank you for watching. That's it for today. Thank you guys and girls.